First of all, we have our investment methodology, which is very strict, very process driven, very research driven. And when you get to that point of actually pulling the trigger on some investments, there are not too many opportunities, right? Alon Ozel, thank you for being on 20 Minute Leaders. How are you? I'm good. I'm wonderful. Thank you very You're much. You're calling from Miami, Florida, right? Yes, yes. Correct. And while things may not be looking up now, by the time this is aired, it will go better, right? Yes, 100%. 100%. No Alon, right before this talk, we discovered that I have no idea what, uh, what, is, what is the responsibilities of running a family office and, and with uh, managing... Uh, managing wealth of families. So I'm very excited for this chat and to learn as much as I can over these 20 minutes. Yeah, I'll be happy to uh, tell you what we do. Alon, what is a family office? Let's start from the basics because it, it sounds like I just don't know. Um, no, you were pretty close. Um, a family office is a family that um, service families that accumulated uh, wealth. Uh, it's sometimes the first generation, sometimes the second, it could be the third and even the fourth generation that uh, holds that uh, wealth. What we do is not only managing the wealth, we also service them in other, in other capacities as advisors, as uh, wealth planners, helping them with exits, helping them with estate, taxes, and um, also educating the next generation about the wealth that they accumulated and Wealth comes with a lot of responsibility. Oh, hold on. You, you, you just, it's like open Pandora's box because you're basically saying like you do everything for the family because it sounds like there's so many moving parts besides educating the new generation. Uh, you know, all of a sudden you have, a, you have like an 18 year old who's now adventuring into the world and they, his, his or her family has wealth and they want to be educated about that. You're saying you're also helping them understand the taxes behind their estates. And, 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 and what you mentioned before, which was fascinating was that you don't necessarily just look for new opportunities to advance the wealth, but you're all, you're mainly looking to preserve the wealth and how to do that responsibly. Right. Right. Of, of course you have different types of, of, uh, of families and different types of, so if the, you know, the son still is uh, at a young age, he still wants to accumulate more um, wealth. So you, you, you might have different um, objectives in different uh, people, but in general, these people have accumulated a lot of wealth. At some point, what you want to do is take the majority of that wealth and move it and manage it in a way that you preserve your capital. You grow it by, let's say, 5% plus inflation or, or something like that. But the most important thing is you want to manage your risk. You want to stay in the game. You want to don't have... You don't want to have drawdowns of 20, 30 percent, where this could actually change your uh, your way of life, your standard of living. This is something you don't want to happen. At this point, you also want to focus more about philanthropy. A lot of them do philanthropy um, uh, early on, but at some point, you get to the to that stage where you can really make a difference, and they all want to do that. Okay, and how do you even get to, to be and to run a family office? So, you know, what, what path did you take in life to get to the point where you're, you're reaching this, where you're, you're doing this and you're excited by this work? <laughs> it's, it's kind of boring. I always did the same thing. Uh, <laughs> it's not, I, I, min I finished my military service, I joined the Ministry of Defense for a little bit, and then I started as, working as a trader. Um, that was a very long time ago. And you chose to go into family offices instead of going to investment banking, instead of going to Wall Street. I mean, you had a bunch of different options, right? Right. So prior to this uh, position, I, uh, I managed an endowment. An endowment is like the, you know, uh, the funds that Yale runs, uh, Harvard, all these, there are a lot of stories about these type of funds. So I managed a fund uh, uh, like that for nine years. Uh, and at some point when I decided to move, um, to move forward, um, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go back to uh, the old Wall Street. Uh, I call it where 
there's a lot of conflict of interests. It's all about the sales. It's all about the, I wanted to be able to do the work that I love, which is mostly the research. Um, and uh, you know, I always tell people 90% of the work is the research. 10% is the actual investments. And it, it, it takes time to get to that point where you can pull the trigger. Yeah, you know, I'm imagining you, I'm imagining you sitting in the office with the fam- like in the family office managing the wealth and all day you're trading, all day you're signing checks and you're making transactions. I guess that's not the case. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. Um, we do a lot of work. Uh, we speak to a lot of people uh, in terms of the, the research that we do. Yeah. There are so many smart people in the world. Uh, if it's either real estate, it's private equity, venture, uh, private debt, you name it. Um, we want to we wanna really drill down into these type of uh, investments to understand where the market is going, what should we be doing, where are the opportunities, and where are the risks, which is the most important thing. Right. And so then, you know, you, I guess, do you work with a family on understanding what type of risk portfolio you want to have? Is it high risk, low risk? What type of investments you're more comfortable with? And then once you decide together, you move on to looking at that vertical and, and narrowing down on the actual investments? Yes, correct. Each, uh, each person, each family have their own uh, risk tolerance, have their own objectives, have their own uh, you know, desires in terms of, again, philanthropy or uh, um, you know, education of the next generation. So it's a little bit different. Uh, but the truth is that, first of all, we have our investment methodology, which is very strict, very process driven, very research driven. And when you get to that point of actually pulling the trigger on some investments, there are not too many opportunities, right? A lot of the stuff that you see and you hear about, it's, it's okay. It's not great uh, because we invest in a more institutional uh, way. We are very strict with the type of investments that we're going to do. Institutional is synonymous to low risk? No, not necessarily. I I don't mind taking risks as long as I'm getting compensated for it. A lot of times you're going to see deals that have the high risk, but the compensation is not necessarily there. So that's something that we're not going to take. In terms of institutions, I talk about, I mean, the management of the, for example, investment fund, the, 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 their ability of back office, due diligence, research. We want to invest with people that have done it a lot, a, a lot of time. And the reality is that if you look at private equity uh, venture, the dispersion in returns between the top tier yeah. and the second one is so big that I don't think you have the choice as a, as a wealth manager to be with the second tier. You want to stick to the top ones. Now, not necessarily you're going to have the access, not necessarily right. you're not going to have the ability to, but that's what we work for. We use our experience, our relationships, our firepower to get into these investments. So, and, is, uh, so when, when a family chooses the right people to run their wealth, I guess in one thing that I, I was, one thing I was thinking, of course, it was that your credibility and your experience, but it sounds like your network and your ability to get into the right investments, that's just as a critical piece, just like in venture capital, are we were as good as the deal flow we're getting and if we don't have access to the best deals then it doesn't matter how good we are at, at looking at at, at, go, at doing due diligence we're not getting access to the best investments yes but the first thing that you said is the more important thing first of all it's your credibility of course they give you to manage their wealth you become part of the family they have to be able to trust you they be able ask to about that yeah they want so that's the first thing Second, it's the access, but also it's the way that you, uh, um, it's everything together. It's the process, it's the risk management. It's, it's not just the best deals. You can have the, uh, access to a lot of deals. If you don't want know how to put them together, you might have overlaps in different areas in the portfolio. And when September 2020 comes, everything goes down together and that doesn't work. Uh, but getting access to the best deals is definitely, uh, it's extremely important. It's not easy, but it's very important. And, and how do you build that trust with a family? Because it sounds like, you know, different from an investment banker or Wall Street or venture capital, you're dealing with souls. You're dealing with people who are putting their trust in you, their, you know, their hard-earned money with you. 
And how do you build that trust? Is it, you know, over time, do you apply to it like a job application? How does that work? Yeah, it, it, it takes time. First of all, this business is all uh, word of mouth. Uh, you get references from, uh, from, from friends, clients, uh, people that think that you're doing a good job or they think that you're a good person and that's why they refer other people to you. Uh, then it's, uh, it's a matter of time. You really have to earn the trust and it's not something that they, uh, they do uh, lightly. Um, there are a lot of things that people are not aware of that are going on in this market. For example, the, the whole conflict of interest in, in, in this business, which is the worst thing. Every uh, time I'm about to ask a question, you bring it up before me. It's incredible. Yes, conflict of interest in managing family wealth. Is it, is it a big thing? Is it hard? Is it like, how do you even avoid that? Or how do you keep checks and balances on that? You have to keep checks and balances, absolutely. And we have our own compliance officer that, that always goes and makes sure that everybody is in compliance. But the reality is that, look, in every, and I'm not bashing here anybody, or I'm just, just saying, in, in the, the model of, of Wall Street and the way that all the big guys work, the, the Goldmans, the Merrills, the, is that when they put you in an investment, private equity, private debt, whatever it is, they're get, getting compensated by the fund, yeah. not only by the client. Now, what about if the fund is not doing well? Are they going to fire them? Is the advice 100% non-biased? It brings you to the point where a lot of times you create conflicts. I'm not saying that you know, it's not a good fund, or it's not, but, but, but having that conflict by definition is a problem. In the family office, when you are compensated 100% by the family and, only, and you can generate more money as a firm only if they make more money. So do you generally, is it generally a cut of the profits or is it also, or is it more salary driven? In no, this is, this is uh, and, and, and this is one of the things that's uh, very interesting about uh, multifamily office. Um, if you want to build your own family office as a family, <laughs> and you need a, a minimum wealth of between half a billion and a billion dollars because... Really? Well, you want to attract talent, right? Talent is expensive. If you run a, a startup, you need to pay your employees a lot of money. If you talent, went, then people like you who are knowledgeable enough to make the right investments, right? That's the talent you're talking about. Exactly. And it's a team. It's not one person that, that can of do course, it. Of course. Yeah. But when we put a couple of families together, they share the expenses. And that's why this model works. But even when they share the expenses, are those expenses salary driven or, or equity driven in the profits? No, no, no. This is only a percentage of the wealth that's being managed. So if you're not doing well, obviously your revenues are going to go down. Um, right. But, it's, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's only one portion. We, we never had an issue about the, uh, the, the fees that we charge or, or anything like that. If you have an issue, it's going to be something completely different because this is not going to make or break your, your uh, investments, right? It's, it's something small. It's about how serious you take the relationship, how dedicated the team is, and how much value you can add to the family because, you know, with all the respect, these are families with a lot of resources. They can turn to almost any accountant, any attorney, any, right? What do you do better? Can they be, can they sleep well at night knowing that you manage all these issues? That's, that's fascinating. So, you know, just like, a, you know, an entrepreneur or CEO may have ambitions to grow their startup from, you know, a $10 million valuation to $100 million to a, to a unicorn, do, do family offices or multifamily offices have this ambition of, of, you know, reaching for the, you know, the most wealthy families, both because then they, the percentage of the profits is the greatest because you're, you know, you have more assets, you're putting more, you're investing more, but also because of the status of it. Is that how it works? I don't know if it's the status, it's more the challenge uh, to be able to show that what you do is really unique. It's really That's different. what all the CEOs are saying. Come on. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, uh, look, in any business that you do, unless you have um, an incentive, right? Yeah. 
So it's, it's, it's all about that. But when you're able to put all of the incentives together, right? Right. And then it works. But you can't have the conflicts. The conflicts are just, at some point, they're just going to destroy the, the relationship. No, no, I'm, I'm sure. I mean, I, th- that's what it sounds like. It's, and are these long-term relationships or short-term? How, how long does the average person spend with a family? Very long-term, very long-term. Um, we have uh, families that have been with us for three generations. Three uh, generations. Generations, so that's a very long time. Uh, I like okay. that you're counting it by generations because essentially what you're saying is that the, when a new generation comes, they have to decide they almost have to decide whether they're continuing to work with you or they're going to, to others, right? Very true. So the statistics is that the second generation, you have a 50-50 chance for them to stay with you. Wow. The third generation, it's dropping to single digits, <laughs> right? So if you is didn't... That because, is that because they have a conflict with their parents and they want to, to go on a different path or because they, they know others or they feel like they want to reinvent themselves? Not necessarily. It's, it's, uh, uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, millennials, uh, they have different objectives. They have a different way of seeing the world. They want to do things differently. And unless you can accommodate that, you know, there's not a common language. It's, it, and, and it's a problem. And that's why we have younger people also working with us because they have to make that decision once the wealth is transferred, if they're going to stay with that person. You have to do that work well in advance, explain to them and help them get to their, to their goals, right? They'll feel comfortable, they'll stay with you. But if you don't, again, the statistics is terrible. Wow. And so, so what it sounds to me is that what's really special here is that on one hand, you have just as great as a responsibility as if you're in investment banking. I would argue that you have even more responsibility because you're dealing with actual people, you know, and these are relationships that you're building, but you have to employ these, these interpersonal relationships and skills to actually build trust over time, right? This is not just, you know, a transactional relationship that will change when you, when you screw up, but when you screw up or when, when, when markets fall or some decisions weren't the optimal, that interpersonal relationship you have with them, that's where, that's where it really counts, right? So that you continue and you continue that work together. Yes, it's, it's extremely personal. Um, I get to the point where you help with uh, funeral arrangements. Um, it's, wow. It's, uh, it's very, very, uh, very deep. Of course, it's, it's as deep as the family wants to take it. But of once they, they're able to trust you, then, then you can do a lot for them. And uh, you're happy to do that. Interesting. Okay, so what excites you most about this job? What excites you most about, about running a multifamily family office? Oh, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's the, the research process. It's the ability to try and build that puzzle to understand how the world operates because I, I haven't figured out out yet. Um, You're very but, independent uh, in doing that, right? Because you don't have, you can basically, uh, you can offer anything. It's up to, you, you, can, uh, you can bring to the table any, any ideas. I can, yes, the, the, the bringing the ideas is not the problem. It's first of all, you have to understand the, 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 whole, the, the big picture, right? How the world operates, the economy, the different um, um, cycles in the economy. And once you understand that, they, then you know which type of investments you want to bring into the table. A good investment by itself not, is not necessarily a good idea. It doesn't mean that it's going to go well with the rest of the investments that you have. Right. And sending the, the, the economy, the capital markets, that's the challenge. That's the big deal. Understanding that some assets correlate over time, but at some point that correlation is going to break and you cannot trust that correlation to build your portfolio. And right. we see that over and over again. But unless you have a process, and it's all process, 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 you're going to miss that. And you miss that at the most important critical point. It's so, so interesting. Alon, before we leave, what is one thing that I can learn as you know, a young entrepreneur or a young, you know, I, let's say a young wealth manager of my own? I don't have much wealth, I, n- nothing at all. But, but, I, but I, not, nevertheless, I do have to manage whatever I do have. What can I learn from your experience in managing my own wealth as I go down the path of life as an engineer, as an entrepreneur, uh, or you know, as anything? Oh, uh, 
I hope it's not going to sound um, bad, but uh, I learned that what you study in school is very different from the real, real world. Right. The economy doesn't operate like that. Uh, markets, uh, even companies don't operate like that. Uh, get your, your hands dirty. Um, kick the tires, do the groundwork, learn how the macro environment really works, not necessarily what you see in, you know, supply and demand charts in, in school because it, it doesn't it, really... It's all about hindsight and, you know, engineering and entrepreneurship is all about foresight. So it's... Exactly it's like that. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. I love it. Alon, before we leave, three words that best describe you. Only three words. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, the important things in life, then I'll say uh, a husband, a father, yes, friend. I love it. And I love that none of the three words are necessarily correlated to the specific work that you're doing. And I think that speaks a lot about the, you know, the, the personal nature of the work that you're doing, that you're not just an economist, you're not just a financial advisor, you are, you're, you're relationship driven. And that's what guides it, which I think is wonderful. It's all about relationships. It's not. Work is work. I love it. Alon, thank you very, very much. And, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. You too.